Welcome back. Um, and if you just tuned in, well, you missed that absolutely pleasant surprise of having Israel I, um, jump in into the studio. But he'll be back with us um, tomorrow and Wednesday, um, you know, just to do Christmas with us, you know, and before he goes off again. So thank you to Israel um, for coming in. OK, so we're moving on to our next conversation. And remember, I was telling you about the end of year series that we're having with some members of parliament. We kind of want to just dive into how, you know, everything is working, what the expectations are. And we know that today um, the E-Levy will be back on the table for discussion and all of that. And of course, we will be bringing you up to the date on all of those issues. But we sat down with MP for Boku Central, Mahama Ayarga. Here's Chrissy Parker Wilson's conversation with the lawmaker. Ghana's hung parliament a year under review. I mean, um, just about a year ago, Ghanaians decided to ensure that parliament uh, had almost equal numbers with the NPP and the NDC. Of course, we know that the independent candidates, uh, the former MP, chose to do business what the NPP caucus in Parliament, so they are 138, whereas the NDC is 137. We are going to look at how the numbers have been over the over the year uh, and the review, and what is happening now is President Akufado going to face a tougher opposition in the next three years, uh, looking at events of recent past or not. Today, I'm privileged to have with me the Member of Parliament for Boko <coughs> Central. Uh, this is his fourth time in Parliament. And uh, of course, he's a lawyer, a very senior member of the House. A Harvard trainer, as I say. Honorable Mahama Yagra, thank you very much for uh, your time. I uh, hope you're doing well. And then, how is the business going with you? Oh, thank you very much. But I, I prefer that I am introduced as somebody who went to Makola Law School <laughs> and the Faculty of Law. I mean, to be frank with you, I think that, you know, um, lecturers like uh, Professor Henry Temensa Bonsu. Mm -hmm. Professor Kofi Kumado, uh, Professor Bene, uh, Kwashiga, they molded our lives much, much uh, better and shaped mm. our careers mm. than the short stays in graduate school and, okay. and et cetera. Even though, you know, a place like Harvard gets branded so well and, you know, you get exposed to a lot, mm. but the real foundation Okay. was our uh, Legon Law Faculty mm, days. The LRB days. Uh, yeah, mm. because those days, uh, it wasn't easy okay. to emerge as a graduate of the University of Ghana Law Faculty. It wasn't mm. easy. Mm. Because I keep reminding people that today people feel that it's so difficult to get into law school. That's true. You should have been there those days. No, but it's, it's difficult to get into law schools these days. I mean, if you look I'm, at what's I'm, happening I'm in recent been, you past. You should have been there those days. But were there limitations as well back in the day? You should have been there those days. Let me tell you what happened. Mm. The whole of Ghana. Imagine how many secondary schools there are in Ghana, or they were in Ghana. Mm. At a time. At that time. Mm. And at the end of the year, after A-levels, only 100 students were admitted into the University of Ghana Faculty of Law. What was that uh, the number? Admitted. Yes, this for admission. Admitted. Yes, into the Faculty of Law. Only 100. That was the quota. I mean. That was the quota. The whole of Ghana. I see. Only 100 students into the University of Law Faculty of Law first year. And that admission didn't guarantee the 100 students that they will become you know, graduates in, 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 in law. At the end of first year of university, at the end of first year of university, that's what they used to call FUE, oh. exams. Oh. Only 40 of even the 100 were admitted into the LLB class. I see. Only 40, four zero. And then an additional 20 were given permission to do courses at the law faculty, which enabled them to gain admission to the Ghana School of Law to pursue the professional course. Oh. So in effect, at the end of uh, three years of study at the faculty of law, only 60 will be able to proceed to the law school. Oh, to the professional course. So it meant that 
the whole country, all secondary schools put together, at the end of each year, only 60 will go to Makola mm. to study law. So the problem has so, been there, not today, yes, it's been so, there over years so gone by. So you can imagine what type of work my colleagues and I had to put into being among that 40 mm. to be, you know, uh, LLB graduates. Right. And of course, to go to uh, Makola, uh, that small number. And don't forget that today, with the benefit of technology, the students can have the entire Ghana law report on their laptop. On their laptop and their phones. They can have the entire All England law report on their laptops. You know, they can have all the legislation on their laptops. In fact, they can have textbooks, soft copies mm. of textbooks. So you could just sit at one place uh, today and do all your studies. You know, this, you had to go to the library and look for the Ghana Law Report, wherever you'll, you'll find it, and look for the All England Report, look for every law report that you needed to study, it. every textbook. And there were limited copies. I mean, it wasn't as if because we were 60, there were 60 copies of, let's say, a textbook on no, but equity. No, no, the dynamics have changed. I mean, there will be like 15 be, copies. Right. So you will all be, 60 of you will be scrambling over 15 copies. Mm. So it, was, it wasn't easy. But the dynamics and, have and, changed. And, and, and the lecturers, I mean, we're excellent, and they molded us into right. what many of us are today. Mm. And so I, I, I prefer all the time that credit is given to them. Mm. How about just a Brandon? Mm. And, and, and so I, I'm proud of, you know, my lecturers like Kofi Kumado, uh, Henry Temes. Uh, you just talked about a loss. Uh, let me just take later, a bite on this. Professor Bene, mm. and et cetera. All right, let me take a bite on this before I move on to uh, issues of parliament. So... Um, if you look at w what you just said, comparing to what's, what happened back in the day and what's happening now, uh, would you say that it's uh, the students who are agitating or persons who are agitating for the expansion of uh, access to law school uh, is unjustifiable? Because even at your time, the quota was so small. No, but the population has increased exactly. rapidly. Mm. Population has increased. Um, resources uh, uh, should be more available now. Yeah. Uh, so opportunities should be more available now. So in spite of what happened and in the so, past? And so in spite of what happened in the past, mm. we should make sure that there's increased uh, uh, opportunities right. for people. I mean, the economy is expanded. That's right. Our democracy is blossoming. We've replicated many institutions. Decentralization has deepened. So many structures of governance at the local level. The judiciary has expanded. So many courts across the country. And we are basically defining ourselves as a rule of law country and therefore you know there should be many lawyers okay. to service every existing institution so that we cut down on waste waste is 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 is, is where you know people uh, because they don't know the law and they don't get proper legal advice and etc mm -hmm. tend to do things that end up costing the state just take for instance how much the state pays annually by way of judgment debts mm -hmm. A lot of the judgment that will arise from, you know, absence of proper, proper legal, legal advice mm. to the institutions as they engage in either contracts or, you know, transactions with, with, with other institutions. So if you look at how much you waste on, you know, judgment debt, uh, if you had rather positively used those numbers uh, money-wise to pay an increased number of legal advices to all government institutions and, and therefore expand facilities at the law school to be able to bring in those numbers that you will need, uh, you will find out that actually first you'll be creating employment and those money sort of going into private pockets by way of damages will actually be going into the pockets of you know, uh, lawyers as salaries and emoluments and then everybody is, is, is happy. So I think that we need to create more opportunities, we need to expand the facilities and uh, students must continue the fight. Those of us here will also continue the fight. And uh, the key issue that we've been advocating for is liberalization of the liberalization of the the um, the sector. Mm. That is to say, the General Legal Council okay. should allow as many private laws 
schools as possible to be created. Right. They should rather strengthen the regime of regulation mm. and monitoring. So you go to Ken University, UCC. Ah, it is all of their law yeah. schools. Mm. But I know that the profession being also private centered, the entrance must be regulated. Right. So even if in principle they decided, look, given the market, every year we should have um, 1,500, 600. Still allow people to have access to as many law schools as possible, right. convenient. And at the end of the year, do a bar exam. And then Those who pass. St structure it in mm. such a way that the bar exam must produce not more than 1,000 uh, people who should go through a very qualified uh, co lawyer. Very qualified lawyer. Yeah, right. I mean, you know, so even in the US and other places where you do a bar exam at the end of your, 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 your study, it's not everybody that gets in. I mean, they definitely have a way of regulating the numbers that are getting into the profession. I think that it's, it's a culture of most professions yeah, but, 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 that but, but, you but, regulate but, the numbers. The house, the house, a few weeks ago, you issued a directive to the Attorney General to ensure that the 499 students have been admitted into the law school. What's the update on that briefly? Well, I mean, he issued a statement saying that we had no authority to direct yes, him. Yes. And, but and then the president had directed mm -hmm. him, and therefore he had taken steps to ensure but, but, but that. But Mr. filed a motion, um, a vote of censure. I, I should think so against him. I don't know if you know about it. Uh, yeah, I recall that Muntaka yeah. uh, brought a motion. I, it wasn't filed, actually. Wasn't filed. I think there was okay. discussion mm. of a motion to that effect, okay. a vote of censure. But yeah. uh, it wasn't filed. I don't recall signing, because if, if it was filed, I would have been one of those signing okay. it. But it wasn't, it wasn't filed. Uh, the minister appeared before the Constitutional, Legal, and Parliamentary Affairs Committee. Mm. And to be frank with you, I was there, and the committee really took him on for See. that position that uh, he took. But essentially, he said he felt that was his uh, um, legal opinion. Oh. And as a uh, principal advisor to government, if he has a legal opinion on a matter, he should publicly state it. Oh. And so what he said was his opinion as attorney general uh, regarding what the, the, the legal position is, we disagree with him. Uh, uh, that, you know, um, as a parliament, we cannot pass a resolution directing that he should do something for which his ministry has already come to us for appropriation and we have released budget for it. Because essentially our point was that you came to us asking for X amount of money for the General Legal Council yes. to run the law school Hi. in anticipation that they will admit X amount of students, if those students pass the exams. Now, the issue before us is that those students say they have passed the exams by your standards. And we look at the numbers, and the numbers fall within what we have appropriated mm, for you. The number falls within. That was I our see. argument. So our argument is that if the number falls within what we have appropriated for you, we can direct you that mm. since they have passed the exams, take them. Mm. Because actually, we've budgeted for that. You know, yeah. that was the angle of the, the committee, committee, the Constitutional, Legal, and Parliamentary Affairs Committee. But then we went, you know, back and forth, and um, we, 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 took, we took our position that, you know, we could direct him, and he took his position that, you know, as a... So what was the resolution advisor. going forward? What was the resolution now? I mean, before the Constitutional, Legal, and Parliamentary Affairs mm -hmm. Committee, that was not really the matter before us. Okay. The matter before us was estimates for his sector. Okay. But I'm just saying that there was a platform where, where you, you know, the fed. parliament took, took him on. And that was uh, at the level of uh, the committee that mm. superintend over his uh, sector. But did you see uh, uh, when the engagement was going on on the concrete step being taken now to get the people admitted? I believe he must have mentioned it, but I, 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 I think that it was a much of a public statement. Anyway, he stated that they were going to take them. So but those of us interested actually, need mm -hmm. to follow up specifically to see what was uh, being, right. being done. Now, let's journey to the house, uh, the chamber. and. Um, the day your leader, I don't know, removed the motion seeking to set aside approval of the budget by one sided uh, majority caucus of the House, you seconded the motion, of course, captured in the votes and proceedings. The first deputy speaker threw out the motion, in fact, after the debate for close to two hours, he dismissed the whole thing. For you, um, as a seconder, how did you feel? I mean, I want to know your initial reaction to his decision to throw out the motion. Well, I mean, naturally, I. 
like my leader, have been disappointed mm. uh, in the decision of uh, the first deputy speaker. Uh, because all along, we're all led to believe that he had actually allowed the motion uh, to be moved by Honorable Haruna Idrisu, that he had allowed me to second the motion. Mm. And I have repeatedly said on TV and radio that even the official reporters also thought that he had allowed the motion. And so the following day votes and proceedings captured what we believe was the proper position, that he had allowed the motion to be moved by Haruna and that I had seconded it. And he had gone beyond that to actually allow debate on the motion. Okay. And then we're at the stage where he was supposed to put the, the question. But he says otherwise. I mean, now, um, naturally, we were disappointed okay. that he had taken that position. We challenged his uh, decision by bringing a substantive motion. Um, we're not in doubt that he'll be in a fix because the system in Parliament is funny. Ordinarily, when you're challenging somebody's decision, mm. you must go to a body above that person, okay. ordinarily. Mm. So when you have your rule saying that if the speaker is wrong, you can only challenge his decision by a substantive motion. And the motion has to go to the same speaker for him to admit so that his decision can be questioned properly. In, in, in most systems, you don't have that way of challenging somebody's uh, decision. And, that position, and so it takes, it, takes, it, takes a, it takes a very strong person mm. to open up to a challenge. And, and, and I don't think the speaker displayed that strength of character. Because somebody's challenging my decision, ordinarily I'm like, okay, let's go through the process. Mm. He should call for the official report. What did the reporter say? He should call for the audio of proceedings that day and play it. And everybody will hear the chronology of events and speeches and what everybody said and whether or not he had actually allowed it or not. It is open to investigation. It is open to investigation. So you think he doesn't have the tough skin to accommodate uh, more like someone trying to question his decision? It didn't come across as uh, a person who has that capacity to tolerate his decision being questioned. He didn't come across... Uh, I see, but that aside, the, 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 the populace, I mean, the, the electorate have been uh, putting the minority caucus on the blame board. And I'm going to ask you a direct question about, on the hand side, do you think that deciding to boycott the proceedings on Tuesday, we saw the approval of the budget about the MPP caucus, you think that the approach was, the strategy was wrong, the approach was wrong? As a minority... In all sincerity, we were wondering whether mm. that was the best approach. Okay. We ourselves were wondering whether that was the best approach. But interestingly, the following day, our fears were confirmed. Why do I say so? We debated among ourselves as to whether we should go into the chamber or not. If we went into the chamber, will the first deputy speaker allow a fair process in terms of the application of the rules? Okay. Um, they had educated the public that with 137, you couldn't take a decision. So we took a position that if we were not in the chamber, they will also be 137. But if you were in the chamber, they could be 137, 137, and the motion would still have been lost. We took a position mm. that if we were not in the chamber, there will be 137. And so the public will then see that they also didn't have a number okay. to take a decision. So that was our tactical position. Now, there were those who said, oh, let's go into the chamber, and there will be 137, and then we'll be 137. So the motion will be lost. Are you getting the right. situation? Right. But then there were those who said, will the speaker allow us to go through the process fairly mm. if we're in the chamber? So let's not take the risk. Because if we enter the chamber, the question of quorum, the question of quorum 
would be defeated because once we're in the chamber, then the quorum will be, you know, uh, 274. Right. 274, so they will have quorum. Sure. But our argument was that they also didn't have, if they said we didn't have quorum because we're 137, then they also will not have quorum because they will be 137. Mm. Okay? And our strongest point was the quorum argument. Okay. And if we enter the chamber, that argument will be lost. And the speaker probably would have found a way of making it impossible for our numbers to count. Then the following day, we said, okay, let's go into the chamber. They are 137, we are 137. Let's challenge their decision and see. And when we challenged their decision, did he allow a vote? Mm -hmm. He didn't allow a vote. So if he had allowed a vote, maybe our motion would have also been lost because they are 137 and we are 137. Sorry. So why didn't he even allow a vote where our motion stood the risk of being lost? So the decision to absent yourself from the chamber, was it voted on at the corpus level? Oh, I can't, just I a can, I can't tell you how we take our decisions at caucus meetings. <laughs> <laughs> because then, if I, I ask this question because, yeah. you see, they, there has been, as I said, blame game. They've put you on the blame board. Um, uh, Suleiman Abraham has spoken. Martin Amudu, your very uncle, has also spoken that they think that the minority and the majority in parliament is playing the ordinary Ghanaian. One breath, you say you rejected the budget. The next breath, you stay out of the chamber and allow your opponent to approve the budget. Are you playing us? No, we didn't allow our opponents to approve the budget. We deprived them of a quorum. And that was why he had to count himself to add to constitute a quorum. Mm. You saw that he did the absenting of mm. counting himself. And of course, there are very senior lawyers in town who have also taken a position right. that the speaker could not have counted himself to constitute a quorum. Yeah. So if the speaker hadn't done the absurd thing of counting himself to constitute the quorum, what would have happened? Our strategy would have been very successful. Mm. He should have taken a principal position that since they didn't have a quorum because they were 137, you also don't have a quorum today because you have 137. So go out there and then engage politically and come back. But he bulldozed his way and counter himself, contrary to what generally people felt should be the legal position, just so that he would constitute a quorum so that they would do whatever they wanted. I see. So can the minority be trusted going forward in this aid parliament? Because the allegation has been that you cannot be trusted. The Ghanaian people cannot put their hopes in you that you will do the right thing to defend the ordinary Ghanaian. And I'm in reference to Martin Amiru's article and also Suleiman Ibrahim. I get surprised. I get surprised because, actually, the minority has been performing magic. Mm. We've been, been performing, performing magic? magic, yeah. Mm. And the reason why I say we've been performing magic is that in a numbers game, a numbers contest, any given day, 138 should beat 137. In a numbers game, where everybody takes his position. 138 should beat 137. But we have consistently, when it mattered, beaten the NPP with their 138. Oh. Came to election of speaker, we beat them. With our 137, we beat them and got a speaker. They brought a budget, and to their shock, with 137, we managed to defeat the budget. So, ordinarily, it is a miracle that we have been performing. How we manage to strategize and emerge victorious and even create doubts about their, 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 their capacity to win fights in the house. Mm. You know, we should be commended. So I get surprised when people are like, have you forgotten that they are 138 and we're 137? <laughs> they are 138, we're 137. And there's a speaker who doesn't vote. So ordinarily, how is it that 137 beats 138? But consistently, we have emerged victorious, yeah. or even created doubt as to whether or not they have won. Yeah, but you see, in spite of that, you've received harsh criticism from. It's from because Daniel. it's because our, we are we are victims of our own success. Mm. We are victims of our own success because we were successful at winning the speakership in a keenly contested race. People feel that we should always be able to win whichever way. And we hold ourselves to that standard. We try to win, whichever way. So we've become victims of our own success. 
But I want it known mm. that in this parliament, the NDC is 137, the NPP is 137, and there's one independent who has chosen to go with the NPP. So technically, in voting numbers, they are 138. And you can assure that going for the next three years. And you see, mm. votes on the budget, on legislation, and so many other things is open. It's not secret ballot. Okay. It is only votes on appointments that is secret ballot. I'll come to that. And when it's secret ballot, it's easy for you to secretly go on one side without being noticed by your party. But on the budget, it's open voting. But so looking at the nature of the parliament we have now, would you encourage for secret voting? Indeed. If we could actually amend mm. our rules to allow for secret vo uh, uh, voting, even on ordinary issues, I dare say that we'll be surprised at the permutations anytime there's a big issue. I mean, we failed to manage our numbers when we're appointing ministers, when we're voting on the appointment of ministers. We failed. About 20 to of manage the our numbers voted yes, in exactly, favor of the exactly. ministers. At the same time, when it came to appointing the speaker, they also failed. Are you getting the situation? So don't be surprised what the dynamics would look like if all the votes were secret. But as it stands now, on policy issues, on the budget, on legislation, and etc., you know, um, numbers will remain where they are. Secret ballots, you can't tell where it will go. Now, in spite of all that, I mean, the year and the review has generally been one in which the parliament has worked the way that it normally works. Legislation that have come before us, loan agreements, policy documents, generally. Even the last budget, the one that we are now reviewing, we went through without much uh, rancor. Okay. But on this occasion, we have a genuine disagreement on the issue of the electronic well, It's not everything say, uh, in no, there. No, I've had people say that. In fact, you know, it's not really genuine uh, disagreement. Perhaps uh, under gain your position, as the political fortunes that you look towards uh, to in 2024, where if you allow the e-levy to pass, government will mobilize the needed revenues and the resources to prosecute the agenda, which at the end of the day might affect your fortunes in 2024. Not really. Not really. You see, if we are motivated by pure parochial, mm political interest. And partisan interest. And partisan interest. We'll be punished by the electorate. Mm. Trust me. We gauge the electorate. If we are motivated by pure parochial partisan interest, we'll be punished by the electorate because it's not a reflection of their concern. But at the same time, if we fail to carry the electorate with us, they will punish us. And what is the position of the electorate? And it's, you see, this morning I was listening to uh, Kwame Mpieni. Okay. I mean, a renowned MPP economist and leader. He was totally against e levy on Asasi Radio. This morning, I listened to him. He was totally against e levy and thought that it was an unwise policy decision. And you recall during the debate, I described the conduct of the MPP as policy stupidity. And you recall my definition of policy stupidity, where you tax a behavior that you want to encourage. And he shared the same sentiments. Look, we are promoting digitization and then promoting a cashless economy. And many people have started developing a habit of placing their monies on their Momo you know, wallets and keeping the money there for use. Then you want to go in there and start taking 1.75% of their money anytime that they put it there. He says, rational human beings will run out of that place with their money. So you might not even get the money to, to, to take your 1.75%. So you are carrying Ghanaians along. So, so, so reflecting that if we actually fail to oppose this policy, we will be seen, you know, uh, betraying the trust of the people. It's not pure, uh, well, have, simple well, political advantage. Did the NPP allege that uh, John Mahama has been influencing the NDC caucus to oppose this, this, this e-levy? But what is wrong if John Mahama has the capacity to influence the NDC focus? Mm. I mean, Kufu Ado 
has issued orders that no MPP minister or MP should travel outside this country. Okufar is the president of the land, the first gentleman of the land. He, he, leads, he, leads, the he leads the party. He leads the party. No, he leads the party. That's right, that's correct. He leads the party. And, you know, in exercise of his powers as president, he has constrained their freedom of movement. <laughs> <laughs> So what's wrong if John Mahama has control over his caucus? But he, but and and, and, there, and John, there's a policy that the John, general John public Mahama, is against. John and John Mahama also John, shares that position. No, 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 John Mahama is not the leader of the NDC as we speak. The leader of I didn't the say, NDC. I didn't say, I didn't say John Mahama is the leader. Right. I say what is wrong if John Mahama has influence? You cannot officially not be a leader and yet have influence. Hmm. So, you're seeking so his what's wrong? Interest? What's, what personal interest? Well, of course, because he wants to run for president. Is he the only person who will be paying pay Momo uh, taxes? He's not the only person who will be paying Momo taxes. Mm. The general public will be paying. They are the ones complaining. And just as I get signal from my constituents that Momo is not good, I'm sure he too, as former president and having led the NDC several times, mm. is also getting signals from the base of the party that Momo is not good. So he may also have developed his uh, position on the matter on the basis of uh, getting feedback from the grassroots. Mm. But did you reach out to the caucus? I haven't spoken directly with him on the matter, so I don't know if you reached out to, with, to the caucus. But I'm saying that there's nothing absolutely wrong mm. with John Dramani Mahama being able to influence the NDC caucus, especially if, if, if uh, it is about the electoral transaction levy. And I'm not even admitting that he has, but I'm saying there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. You can, you, can, you can say anything that you want to say, but if the policy is good, it's good. If the policy is bad, it's bad. And, I mean, so many things have come to this house that, you know, we've approved for the NPP. Why didn't they complain about John Mahama those days when we're approving many things that, you know, uh, when we're voting for uh, ministers and uh, the NDC caucus was being bashed left and right, mm. You know, why didn't they blame John Mahama for that? Was the caucus in crisis at the time? Oh, we faced challenges. We faced challenges. And we kept telling people that when it comes to secret ballot, it's difficult to hold the line. Just the same way that MPP had difficulty holding the line when we were voting for, for speaker. Especially when it comes to appointments. Because on the issue of appointments, people transcend political lines. Let's say that, you know, MPP is in government and then they opt to appoint uh, a roots minister from somewhere in my region. Okay. Uh, it becomes difficult for me to go and explain to people from my region that I'm opposing a regional a roots minister coming from my region. Because people say, oh, wait, wait, it doesn't matter who is in office. Once the person is a roots minister and come from this region, there's a, a, a possibility that we will all benefit because he might just, you know, have a better knowledge of the poor root situation in the region, so the, the and, then, and then invest. Ethnic consideration. Yeah, ethnic consideration. So, mm. so you will go to, you know, NDC MPs from that region, and they will say, well, you know, uh, we share party position, but uh, we come from a region, and that region, they are happy that the president is giving that region an opportunity to mm. produce a We're son of the region. Yes. We're son and so if region. we are seen opposing, even the small support we have, we we'll also, you know, lose that. They think that we are being parochial and selfish as a political party. Mm. So it's difficult to convince people, especially, you know, with respect to candidates for ministerial appointment coming from their ethnic tribe, their region, their religious groups, or even their gender. You find women say, oh, ah, you people say women are not competent. Eh, let us also be there with our incompetence. Mm. You, you get the point? See. So, you know, a woman nominee comes and you say, oh, she's not competent. The woman says, oh, don't worry. If we don't try our hands, how can we become competent? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so they are using the position as trial now. Yeah, so, so it becomes difficult to hold a line on, on, on those occasions. And, of course, it puts a lot of pressure on, on the caucus. But, you know, you move on and an opportunity comes for you to... Uh, you know, reassert yourself, and you do that. And at the time, I mean, people are like that there were deep cracks in the NDC at the time. Of course, a member of the of the of the committee, the the, the appointment committee, uh, um, someone looked at the black even 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 resigned. Ah, uh, well, I mean, so it, the it's, 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 it's the unfortunate. Factions? It's unfortunate that he 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 tendered in a resignation. Oh. Um, maybe just some disagreements and. Um, People's different 
styles and, and approaches to dealing with uh, situations. But was it the right approach that he adopted? Because some say he betrayed the caucus. And I think that he is entitled to his uh, personal view of how he should conduct himself, mm -hmm. and I cannot be a judge of his choice of uh, approach. Um, We've moved on, and, and I think that we're making progress as a caucus. Those moments will come, but it is how you continue from there that matters. At the time, any question the leadership qualities and skills of your leader, how will address you? Uh, We've never questioned the leadership qualities of our leader. No, they think that he sometimes he substances his stance for the NPP. I don't think so. I don't think he ever substances his stand for the NPP on any uh, matter. I think at all times, we actually agree on how to approach a matter. Mm. At all times, at all times, Haruna has never made a move that we've all not agreed on. Haruna has never made a move that we've all not agreed on. Of course, you can't have everybody agreeing on, because even at the meeting, a strategy meeting, there will be disagreement. But then the understanding is that once we as agree that this should be the approach, that becomes the approach. And you have to go and speak in support of that approach. So. The perception that Haruna is weak or he substance his stand for MPP is because they don't know what we agreed on. Mm. They just don't know. They just don't know. I mean, let me defend him. Recently, there was this discussion about 1%, 1%. Mm. It wasn't Haruna's decision. It was not. It was not his decision. He made a mistake of saying it. But it was not Haruna's decision. It was a decision by the caucus? Let me be honest with you, mm. uh, and I speak in defense of Haruna, that they wanted to engage with us. Okay. We sent them to go and engage. At the point of engagement, you know, the thinking was that you can't go engaging and say you will never, you know, concede to anything. Are you getting the, yeah. the situation? Yeah. But you. if the engagement is successful, fine. We will all review it. But if the engagement is not successful, then nothing has been agreed. So they went and engaged. And the NPP, they, 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 they insisted that they must have the tax. And then, you know, the discussion came around, OK, if you must have the tax, we are also totally against the tax. But if you must have the tax, Civil society people saying that you should start from a very low threshold. Mm. That's what signals we are picking from civil society groups, economists, and everything. They are saying that you must start from a low threshold if you must have the, the tax. And they said, no, we will not start from a low threshold. We will start from 1.75%. If you disagree with us, the lowest we will go to is 1.5%. Then we said, okay, then there's no agreement on anything. Okay. And we walked away. Maybe there's no agreement. Why did he say 1%? That That's what I'm saying. So he made, mistake, he made a mistake. He made a mistake of, you know, you know, bringing out discussions that took place in a mediation exercise. Okay. You get the situation? Mm. It wasn't he on his own going to soften his stand on anything. So let me see here. And now that Haruna never says anything that wasn't discussed at a caucus meeting and wasn't part of an agreed strategy of the caucus. But of course, an easy lies the head that, you know, bears the crown. Yeah. So when there is a slip, of course, as the leader, he takes all the heat and protects all of us. So that is the situation. And, looking at the and so we've never questioned the leadership hmm. of uh, Haruna, and we will continue to stand solidly behind him. Okay. Uh, we'll continue to advise. And you see that I sit directly behind him. Hmm. Uh, he hmm. always tends to uh, I'll be very curious about your sitting arrangement. Yes. The, in, in the chamber, I yes. mean, your, your line, I see, I think a group of lawyers lined up yes. on, on your, on your so main... So he always turns to us. Yeah, I, I, I see. You turn to us. Very hey, bro, what should we do? Hmm. And we say, move in this direction. See. Then we go back, we turn back and also inform 
the people behind that. We are moving in this direction. Because I see uh, so uh, to fight. the finance team, people, the lawyers behind. Uh, was it a strategic arrangement? Yes, that's, 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 it's, a, it's a strategic So, so can you run me through how you, you did that? Uh, we can't tell you because we'll be exposing our strategy. <laughs> <laughs> of course, the viewers would want to know. I mean, no, no, no. Because it's quite interesting. They just monitor the game. And, and I'm going to show they that just monitor, They just monitor the chamber. It's, it's not that easy. So, so let me assure you that we are strongly behind Aruna. Mm. Uh, he leads us well. Uh, there are a lot of challenges. It's not easy to, 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 to lead a, a minority. Is there pressure on him? Naturally, there will be pressure. Okay. Naturally, there will be pressure, especially when we are so misunderstood in mm. terms of uh, strategy. We are in it, so we understand what we are go going through. So is he the right man to lead the NDC in this hung parliament? Is he the right definitely, man? Definitely. Definitely. No doubt about that. No doubt about that. He has experience. He has the support of, mm. of, of the rank and file of... The, the 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 caucus and and so he's doing an excellent job i see we are running out of time but let me just touch on this briefly um the ndc soon will be going for your internal race uh, um chairman of example for general secretary and of course you go to the flag bearer ship. but the flag bearer ship, i understand that john mahama the caucus has decided to back john mahama as the flag bearer how true is this i believe that on any given day john mahama will easily carry the entire NDC along with him in any contest, on any given day. Okay. I repeat, on any given day, until anybody shows that he's exercised bad judgment or leadership, and etc. As we speak, on any given day, I see the rank and file of our party uh, throwing their weight behind. Should he be the one to lead the party in Mahama. for elections? I have no doubt that he will be the one. To lead the party. Do you want him to be the one? I have no doubt that I'm desirous of him leading the party mm. into the 2024 Aren't you discriminating uh, against potential candidates? Dr. Dufo has showed up. Kojo oh, Bonsu wants to contest him. Really? Guzitano also wants to contest. They are welcome. I mean, Guzitano contested the last time. Right. He remains a very good friend of ours and a very good friend of the former president. Mm. And they continue to work together. Dr. It's, it's Dufour, party. Mm, Dr. Dufour is lazy in his boot. I have, so much, his lectures I have, I have so much, you know, admiration for Dr. Dufour. I call him uncle. Mm. I have been in Parliament here fighting to and nail over the closure of his banks and mm. the confiscation mm. of his licenses. Mm. And I will continue to fight for him uh, if the chairman of the committee, uh, first deputy speaker, will sit up and do the work. I will continue to pursue it. Nothing will make me renege on my personal commitment to uh, do for as a former minister of the NDC, as a former governor of the Bank of Ghana, and as a very loyal uh, supporter of, 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 of member of the NDC. And he's entitled to his, his opinion as to whether or not he should also be given an opportunity to, to lead the, the party. And I encourage him to, to pursue his ambitions, except to say that I feel strongly that the rank and file will go with John Dramani Mahama. But it's good to have a contest. It's good to have a contest. Wonderful. Well, thank you for your time um, today. And of course, uh, we are grateful that you've shared with us a few of the things happening in the chamber uh, over the last one year. And finally, uh, the UT case that you're pursuing with Dr. Dufour, I know that uh, the chairman, I don't know, what, what's happening? What was the update? I honestly, <laughs> I honestly um, have been pursuing the matter. Yeah. Um, Unfortunately, you know, initially the chairman was pushing mm. and the Bank of Ghana resisted mm. the jurisdiction of the committee. Right. But the chairman actually pushed, in all fairness to him. He insisted. And uh, the central bank, towards the end of the last uh, session of parliament, did, you know, come clean and, and say that they are now amenable to the jurisdiction of the committee. Oh, okay. So they will submit themselves to the committee. Have they done that yet? Well, they've stated in principle that they will submit themselves to the jurisdiction of the committee. Unfortunately, we went on recess, mm -hmm. and the committee members, it was difficult to get members of people had to travel, people went to constituencies, so it was difficult for them to sit. Then when we resumed, you know, so budget the meeting. budget, and then the speaker has traveled, and then he has to sit in as speaker, mm -hmm. So his availability has been uh, a challenge, and clearly the fact show that it is through no fault of his that he's unavailable to do the committee's uh, work. But I keep pushing him to see if 
um, with the passage of this uh, budget, whether he will have the space to get back to the work of uh, investigating the confiscation of the licenses. And I'm, I want to assure you that uh, many of us who are working and fighting to see if we can get justice for him through this parliamentary process, we may be strong supporters of John Dramani Mahama, but his decision to contest will in no way affect our decision to fight his case in this parliament. Once again, thank you very much. Uh, uh, he's the Boko Central MP, Mahama Ayaga Day. We are Christmas. A few words for your constituents out there. I want to wish everybody well in this uh, Christmas season and the new year. Around this time, there's a lot of traffic. Uh, people are in a hurry to transact business and to provide service and etc. But let's remember that we need to be careful to avoid accidents around this time of the year. Uh, people should be careful when traveling. People should pay attention to the drivers that drive the buses and other vehicles on the highways and monitor them and demand that they are constrained in terms of the speed limits that they use. Um, for my constituents, we've had an unpleasant ending of the year with uh, some elements within the constituency creating um, some situation of insecurity. Uh, happily, uh, I should say that uh, the situation has calmed down. Even yesterday, the curfew was reviewed downwards to 8 p.m. Uh, to 5 a.m. Uh, we'll continue to push for a total lifting of the curfew I believe that all of us in Boku will work towards peace. It's better to live in peace uh, than to live under any condition. Uh, there's nothing as valuable as the peace that we enjoy. So I wish them well in this uh, Christmas season and then the new year. How do you say official for your language? Ah, so, 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 so. <laughs> ah, okay. Uh, I, I, I hope I, I got that right. So, uh, from the Journeys crew as well, I want to wish you a very happy uh, Christmas, of course. And as it already be said, we should be careful, especially those driving uh, from Makra to other uh, places of the country. I am Gosi Parker Wilson, and today my guest has been the Member of Parliament, four time Member of Parliament for Boko Central, uh, Mahama Yaga. And uh, he's also been a former information minister uh, before. Enjoy your Christmas.